All right, so we are live on the Banyan Collective's YouTube page, the fans of Banyan, and most importantly, the group Bourbon Beer and Books. Uh, this is a podcast that is recorded live from the Banyan One studio and uh, also across the country. Sean, you're in the Pacific Northwest. Lee, you're in Florida, surviving uh, hurricanes, tropical storms, and all the things. I'm glad you're here. We had to delay a week. So this is good. We'll wait for people to jump on. This, uh, this month's book... Um, was it's a new novel, uh, correct? This is uh, 2020, I believe. Remote control. So, uh, again, I do not, I do not read these. I get to enjoy from afar while uh, everyone else discusses, and I produce. So we'll bring in Case. Here's Case right there, and I'll let you guys take off with, with remote control. Awesome. So this is Case Johnson along with John Davis at the Camacho Works. And we are talking about remote control, and this is Lee's pick. So I'm going to have Lee, we're going to ask for Lee to jump in and get us started. Hey, yeah. so, oh, sorry, Lee, go Lee, ahead. Sorry. Oh my gosh, I totally cut you off. Uh, yeah, Lee's going to jump in and and uh, uh, lead the way. We do. We can see the comments, and so tell you know, ask Lee, Sean, Case questions. If you're watching, you can see we can see the comments pop up, uh, and we'll address those as we go. All right, Lee. Yeah. So. I can hear myself talking. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this week we are listening to, or we are watching, we are reading. What are we doing? I've only had half a beer. Um, we read Remote Control by uh, Nindy Okafora. And um, this novel, this short novel, is um, about a young girl who finds something from outer space. And it changes her life tragically forever. It imbues her with a power I don't think any of us would want. And uh, this uh, short novel sort of explores what all of that means. And um, the power, we'll just go ahead and give it away because you know pretty much immediately, is um, to take lives. Uh, so she's almost like a remote control for humans. She can just turn you off. Um, it's sci-fi, it takes place in the nearest future. And it's actually uh, a part of the genre of African futurism. You may have heard of Afrofuturism. African futurism is what Okafara uh, defines her writing as. It's a subcategory, uh, and I'm quoting here from her, a subcategory of science fiction that is similar to Afrofuturism, but is more deeply rooted in African culture, history, mythology, and point of view as it, it, as it then branches into the black diaspora. And it does not privilege or center the West. And I think this is a really important distinction. Afrofuturism uh, does often um, revolve partially around Western experiences. And African futurism takes place in Africa um, and, uh, and privileges uh, that those cultures, those many cultures, and um, that um, viewpoint. Um, and so you get a very different kind of work. Uh, and I think that's important to know. It is, well, before I tell you what I think of it, we're going to do our five word reviews. Uh, Sean, what's your five word review? I'm going to be counting. We'll count down. Okay. You know, I always like to go by the rules. Um, my five <laughs> word review is child serial killer. So cute. Shea butter. <laughs> Shea butter. We'll take Shea butter as one. All right. Excellent. Uh, case. What's your five word review? Oh, uh, so mine would be wish I had that power. What? I you, had that power. Case, you want to kill people, man? Mm-hmm. <gasps> Um, no, my five word review is, um, magically, beautifully, disturbingly, um, original content. Original How about that? Content, for sure. Original content. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted more words, so I, I had to stop. Um, I love this book. Uh, that's why I picked it. I had already started reading it when I picked it. Uh, I hadn't finished it yet. And I actually restarted so that I'd be fresh for this. I love this book. I'm giving it a giant thumbs up. You can't see my thumbs. Thumbs up. Uh, did you guys like it? 
I loved it. I loved it. Uh, you know, I read a lot of reviews that a lot of people were saying, this isn't science fiction. It doesn't have lasers and robots and stuff in it. I mean, it's just a kid that's walking across the countryside. No, this is completely science fiction. And the prose was just so uh, oh, stunning. And, and so last uh, last month we were, we were talking about Arthur C. Clarke's science fiction, his prose, and how he doesn't really dive into characters. This was so character driven. This child uh, got this amazing and awesome burden, and and you know, okay. So I'm going to tell everybody right now. We should probably have like one of those flashing flashing things, Brandon, about like um, spoiler alerts. Because we're going to talk about this book, and I have to get it into like how much I, uh, why I loved it. I mean, this she has the power to kill, and she accidentally kills her entire village, including her parents and her brother, who she loved very much. And before she was killing entire villages, she was looking up into the stars on the in the African plain, and 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 like, well, what did the stars say to me? And then writing it in the dirt, like star messages. I mean, that is so pure and and beautiful, and all of a sudden she's killing everybody. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I loved it too. And I think, I mean, people saying it's not science fiction is silly. There was a whole town that was run by this police floating droid robot. Well, there was a droid. He had a droid, right? And then he was a floating... It was a giant. Giant, like... Uh, what would you call him? What would she call him in the book? Rob Robocop. Robocop. Uh, right. Brother Steel. <laughs> Yeah, but, and he would go and scan people for their electronics, and he got really angry, right? He got so angry that he couldn't scan her, which ends up, you know, bringing us very close to the Well, planet. yeah, part of her power was that any uh, – um, and I would love to, to like, kind of dive deeper into this and, un and unfold it a little bit, but part of her power was that any modern technological device that she touched, she killed. That's no the power I want. She can't get in a car she can't look at an iphone she can't go on the internet touch it yeah yeah um yeah and that's that's sort of an interesting thing because it's it's all about that power is fully involuntary and her other power is involuntary at the beginning and she she gains a hold of it so there's there's these two kinds of death that happen in it which is sort of an interesting thing um I was about to say something. Oh, as far as it being science fiction, one of, this actually leads to one of my favorite things about the book, and it's world building. The world building in it is, um, is so there's no info dumps. You. Yeah. There's absolutely no info dumps. Um, you learn about this world so organically. Um, there's a word here and a word there, right? It all starts maybe with the jelly tellies, which I love the idea of. There's yeah. there. Jelly tellies, if we have to guess, it's kind of like a television made of something um, jelly-like, something movable, something probably easier to transport in these areas. But also we get the idea that they're flexible, right? Um, a jelly belly that could fill the whole wall. So we get the idea that they're flexible. Jelly telly, not jelly belly. Um, so I, you know, and then we get like biofabric. We get, we get these words. This is what I think the best science fiction does is it introduces us to a world via vocabulary as opposed to via info dumps and, info dumps, and it all just unfolds uh, beautifully. So that's Completely. one of my favorite things about it. Yeah, and yeah. I, I mean, sorry, like looking at the difference between this and Rama, right? I mean, mm. uh, they're night and day when it comes to this type of storytelling. Uh, like Sean said, with the character development, obviously, uh, Clark does no character development. This book delves so deeply into the protagonist um, and her worries and her fears and her, her pain and everything that she's gone through. But like you said, really, it's like she comes in and, you know, like first couple of chapters in, she's like, well, I'm going to go to Robotown, right? And but we don't get this whole description of what Robotown is until she actually gets to Robotown. And it just it it just unravels in front of us, which I thought was super super cool. And her character her character development went similarly, um, like the brother. We get the brother and who he is and the kind of love he has for his little sister so slowly, and as soon as we fully understand, 
what kind of brother he is, right? The one who's like, doesn't want you to follow, but then loves you dearly. That's when we lose him. And I think that's so heartbreakingly done because it's done so naturally and so gradually. Um, and he, he just, it, he, he feels like anyone's brother, right? Like anyone's big brother. Not that I have a big brother. I'm the oldest, but you know, um, everything that is done, you know, what's interesting to me is it's such a short novel and yet everything is done with patience in terms of the writing, I think. Um, oh, it's beautiful. I, I agree. I, I think her skill was the fact that she doesn't have to have those info dumps. All yeah. of that information gets there and not, I mean, a lot of people when they're doing, you know, exposition will lose the info dumps and put it all in dialogue, which sounds very unethical unauthentic right yeah i'd much rather exposition mm -hmm. <laughs> like if you're gonna do it just don't make a person and phone up right but she does it without having to do either and, and yeah how, how does she do that it's magical i mean i think it would be really cool to kind of like if you had the time uh to plot that out like to go through and sort of highlight how we get information and like how it builds uh, if you're if you're studying world building, I would say this would be a great novel to look at, um, just from a writerly point of view. If you're interested in, uh, especially world building in sci-fi and fantasy, um, what are we drinking? Um, yeah, yeah, so it's time for everybody to shame me. Is everybody ready to shame me? Uh, I am because I know what you're drinking. I'm drinking the craw. Um, I'm drinking black cherry. Ain't no white claw. claw Lee. Ain't no laws with the claw. You got this. Like <laughs> like a true redneck child. This is what I'm drinking. It's all I had in the house. I actually I have a couple of liqueurs, but like I wasn't gonna just sit here and I don't know drink orange liqueur. That would be even more horrible. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Master. I'm not going to sleep tonight because I'm going to have uh, wicked indigestion. Uh, uh, what are you drinking, Case? Uh, I'm drinking a beer. But this is a Breckenridge Brewery uh, lager, which is really pretty good. And then we've Brandon's got a whiskey out there. Um, and it is a... Let's see, it's right here. It's pretty good. It's a... Nice. Uncle Nearest 1856 Premium Whiskey. I've got a little bit of that. Brandon's drinking a little bit of that and a beer as well. And they're good. Um, yeah, I'm sipping because I poisoned myself last Saturday and I'm still kind of like my stomach kind of like it's kind of feels like somebody is in there with nails and scratching at it because I cooked some chicken and uh, I didn't cook it long enough and I thought I did. And so since Saturday, I've been. Um, I've been a little sick um, with like a fever and stuff like that. But you got me. Make sure to cook your chicken all the way through. And if you don't, don't eat it just because you're hungry. That's a, that's the lesson for this week. Uh, you will spend more time in the bathroom in six, four, three days than you'll ever want to. Uh, but the but the liquor is good. This is really good whiskey. <laughs> Sean, what are you drinking? I know it's got to be good. Oh well, it is Lee. Uh, so this is a bourbon from uh, Sisters, uh, Oregon. I talk about Sisters a lot because they're the next town over. But we're also in the Central Cascades, and we live on a chain of uh, extinct volcanoes. Hopefully, they're all extinct. But this is a Broken Top uh, Mountain Whiskey. It's named after one of the, the mountains on the Cascades. It was uh, a super volcano that went off and erosion and everything. But it's still something that uh, hikers, for some reason, like, yep, I'm going to climb that. And, um, yeah, why not bring whiskey while you're doing that? What can happen? Uh, this, <laughs> <laughs> this is 43.75% uh, uh, alcohol by volume, 87.5 uh, proof, and it's aged two years in oak barrels. And then I'm following that with a Corona Extra because I have just been introduced to the Fast and Furious franchise and where all the powers are family. And Corona. And and Knox. 
No. Right? I don't know, Knox. Is that the nitrous oxide? Chemical? Oh, no. What makes yeah. the cars go good? <laughs> How am I the only one who knows this? Yeah. I have three tanks of it in every in every I feel court. like I'm the manliest person now, officially. <laughs> I'm not gonna um, agree with that. <laughs> um hey Sean. Okay. Uh, we got a we got a production tip. Uh, your computer is loud, so you either turn it down a little or if you have headphones, that'd be fantastic. Either either way. Uh, I'll, get, real, I'll get some headphones. I don't, so hey, I want to make a, a, a great announcement. Our our Banyan podcast, the Va, uh, Van Sessions, which is a live studio audience podcast we do once a month here at the Monarch Building in Ogden, was recently sponsored by a local brewer, Roosters Brewing, here in town. So we have a boatload of Roosters uh, beer that everybody drank last Friday. So I said, uh, Case, everybody drank our Roosters, so just bring stuff. So he brought stuff, and uh, so he brought – this Mountain Beach from uh, the Breckenridge Brewery in uh, Pine, Colorado, L, right here, Mountain Beach. And then chasing that, of course, with that whiskey that Case was showing earlier. It's good. And don't worry. Yeah. Kim and Pete, if we had your beer here, we'd be drinking it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we drank it, we drank it all, Kim. <laughs> and, yeah, really good. No, yeah, we drank it all. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say one other thing, um, you know, like – Every time we read a book, I share it on Facebook. Like, this is the book that we're reading. I talk about it a little bit, but I usually always put, like, an Amazon link or, or something like that. Um, I wanted to talk about our independent bookstores and how they're superheroes. Uh, we have one up here in Oregon called North Bank Books. It's on the Columbia River in Washington, and um, it's owned by uh, Stephanie, who is an MFA grad. And I would suggest, you know, look for North Bank Books. Order from your independent uh, bookstores. Absolutely. Um, all right. Shall I ask a question? Yeah, yes. please. Because I have a doozy. I got your answer. Do you? Cook your chicken. There you go. All right. All right. Don't all drink right. bourbon while you're cooking chicken and you'll be <laughs> fine. <laughs> okay. It, this is a good question. This is a hard one. How do you think this book would have been different if it had been written either by a white Western, through a white Western gaze or through a man's gaze? Um, because, I love that question. Because this is, you know, um, this is not our first woman author, although I would, I would argue that our first woman author was a little bit of a spoofy version of our show. Um, it's definitely a first author of color. And uh, I think that changes things. And I think it's a good thing to kind of think about. What do you think? Because I have some thoughts on it, but I'm really curious what you guys think. I love it. Yeah. Um, let me think about it for a second. I, w I actually went to, my brain went to what if the author had made this, the protagonist male, uh -huh. Western society, instead of the author being white male. I mean, what are the it would have like, been a Clint Eastwood movie, man. Yeah, I think that it would have been like the, the this protagonist has to navigate her world through the lens of being a, a young, not just a woman, a young woman, a thirteen, a, barely a woman. I mean, uh, she's right. seven when seven. it starts. Yeah. Yeah, she's five when it she's starts. A little girl, and so I mean, uh, uh, we can look at the other stuff later. But I'm thinking this would be a totally different book with a with a young male protagonist, um, even in Africa or in the, or in Western society. Um, but let me think about the other stuff. Well, I can, I, let me talk about that because so between our last book and this book, I read uh, Ben Percy's uh, The Ninth Metal, which I enjoyed very much. I thought it was really great, but it did unfold like an action movie. Yeah, and OK, so I, I'm telling you that because it's very similar. The there, There's a character that gets um, superpowers from a meteorite and right away the federal government takes the character and like there's other characters that have secret powers and turns into it was very much like a fast and furious movie i would say but this book the in an the, awesome the, way in all oh yeah no i'm all i'm on board i'm team fast and furious i can't wait for f10 but uh the in in I would love to just talk about that on a podcast, but uh, th that aside, um, this book is about a young girl, um, 
you know, very young, seven years old, uh, gets power to kill entire villages and then goes across the countryside killing. And somehow we're like, we're right with you. We're right with you. And, and oh, you got a pet fox. That's amazing. And um, we're, we're all about it. And that comes from the very lyrical prose that um, oh, I want to say, right, Okafor uh, is able to pull off. I, it's just she is so talented. And, and But because she gets into the brain of this young girl, and this is it took it five years where she's just going across the countryside killing people. And it, it, it calls on these old um, myth, mythological tropes. And I want to argue about uh, with Lee about uh, is this mythology or allegory or not. Uh, and we'll definitely do that. But it, it gets in these old tropes where the stranger might be death. So treat the stranger right, which like she goes into every village and she gets her shea butter and she gets fed and she gets new clothes. It goes into so many different um tropes that you'll see in mythology and in in allegory i mean it's, it's written um i would say it's very much more entertaining than the bible is uh but it's written in that allegorical uh type manner i would say so i i don't know if i agree with you on that but i'll, I'll get back to that i would say one big difference that i think would be if it, the gaze was different is um how her body is talked about um, we don't visually see her growing up. Uh, we don't see her body changing. Um, you know, her, her, we know she's bald. Uh, we know her eyebrows have been burnt off. Um, and I don't know if those things would, would even be true. If a, if a man, if your usual male writer who we've read had had written it, um, but you know, there's no there's no burgeoning hips, there's no budding breasts. Um, there is there's a any focal on her is often about sort of her understanding of herself as opposed to our understanding of her. So one of the things you know, her her coming to understand that she is powerful and that she deserves. That that was tribute. very interesting. She deserves. She deserves yeah. tribute. That mm -hmm. that she is powerful, and I don't think we see women in books like that very often. Um, I would say even more interesting is that we went along with her in that. Yeah, we we were like, she yeah, deserves. You know, because okay. usually you would it's like, okay, well, that's a dictator, or that's a fascist, or that's a that's an antihero at the very best. It's it's a villain now. But we're like, nope, she does deserve Because what does she do with that power? All she wants is clothes that look like her mother's. Mm -hmm. Laughter oh my God. that sounds like her father's. Yeah, you oh, know. Coffee um, brought her back, yeah. Yeah, um, she wants the shea butter that makes her not hurt. Mm -hmm. And that smells like home. She wants food. Well, yeah, we want them to give a child food. We can't argue with that. She is literally a child wandering around you know um so she has power but then how, how what does she want from that power right um is pretty interesting and she believes she deserves and i think that's interesting because um what she believes she deserves is 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 almost just basic you know I, what you're talking about really makes me think a lot about like how the Western style of uh, literature, I mean, we stopped winning um, Pulitzer Prizes in, in, in literature a long time ago because we were um, uh, inclusive and, and uh, we just weren't sympathetic. And like if this were written in the Western point of view, uh, and they would either have to with this power, they'd either have to be a hero or they'd have to be a villain. Um, what I think that we're getting, I, I really believe like J.R. Martin's getting this. And that's why everybody loved Game of Thrones. Like we don't have to be a hero or a villain. We can be both. And I think that's what, that's what we're learning as writers in this Western hemisphere is like, it's not so black and white, but I, I think that she's like, She's showing, she's schooling us on that, right? Yeah, and I think it also goes to the technology, right? So when people say this isn't real sci-fi, 
I think that has a lot to do with Western sci-fi, right? It's no, because it's starting from a different technological starting point, right? Um, and a different social driving starting point. Technology is generally based on needs, right? So, you know, a, a jelly telly <laughs> might be not something that we would invent because maybe it's something that a lot of Western society doesn't need um, with, you know, American roads and this, that, and the other, but maybe it is something more useful in an area where the train's a little more rugged. You don't want big metal things that are going to break all over the place, you know, um, or, or the robot, right? The giant robot that's like a traffic light and how they talk about how they came to, to like, I think, so I think that just the sci-fi element itself is, is, would be different. Yeah. Sorry, Case, I've been talking a lot and I hope I'm not cutting you off, but what I want to say is I say Western sci-fi focuses on the, the science fiction, the science and mostly the technology. What, what Okafor did was she's focusing on story and the, the technology was just in the background. And I think that's what we, goes to what we were talking about as far as like, she didn't need to give us info dumps. There's no voiceovers, you know, for like, I love Blade Runner, but like no one else but Blade Runner could really pull off the voiceovers that just tell you everything about a story. I mean, she doesn't have to do that. And that's yeah. what's amazing about it. Yeah. And I think if we're looking at like Western society and, and technology and science fiction is maybe we've just been hammered into us since we were children, that it's always character versus nature or character versus technology or character versus industry, where in this book, uh, the technology and the sci-fi, it wasn't a, a, a versus thing. Yeah, she, she, would, she would kill technology when she touched it, um, but it wasn't like that was her goal to kill technology. It wasn't, it was, it didn't seem like the author came from a point of view where her killing technology made the world a better place. Uh, where in the States, you know, it's always, it's like the Terminator, right? You know, we gotta, we gotta, we, we've gotta kill the technology before it kills us. Um, and we don't, I know I don't get that sense with this book at all. The technology is just there. Um, and it's just, it's a part of the story. The science fiction is just there. It's just a part of the story. We're here. We're, I think we get hammered into storytelling early on. That's always, you know, character versus nature or character versus industry or character versus science. Um, and I think with the sci-fi here it, being written from that point of view, we don't get that us versus them when it comes to technology. Technology is part of the story. I yeah. think I, I, I agree with you because like in, in Western uh, sci-fi, most of the time technology is evil, at least artificial intelligence. But in this book, the artificial intelligence was the hero of the village. And because she hurt the, the AI brother steel that, and that caused a young child to die. She became like, get out of here. What are you doing? We love our, our, our robo uh, stoplight, you know, what are you doing? Get out. And well, that's a huge divide. Well, what's interesting though, is, is sort of how layered that actually is because the kids don't love it. The kids are like, it's spying on us. Mm -hmm. um, true, and true. then, and then we've also got the, the fact that it's not her or us against tech. Um, as a matter of fact, it's really about the corporation, right? There's this sinister kind of background. American oh my God, I wish they got more into the evil medical corporation, that's corporation trying to steal the technology. Um, that's just sort of backgrounded because it's it's not fully relevant to her story. It only is when it is. Um, and then we have the fact that the technology is built by women. The two engineers we meet are women. The imam's the imam's wife at the end, yeah. The imam's wife and the Indian woman who builds drones. Mm -hmm. That was on the bus. Um, but then we also have this corporation that wants the technology and 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 not to give away the ending. That the, is a the, 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 the corporation wants the magic, not the technology. They have well the alien the, technology. Well, it, okay, and that's where it goes back to me thinking it's mythology versus you. But I, I think what she has is magic, 
and that co the evil corporation understands all of the technology, but they want the magic. And See, I think, I think it's alien technology. I think it's alien technology. But all 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 magic is arguably a lot of sci-fi and fantasy will tell you technology we don't understand is magic, right? So it does, that's that's probably a wash. We're not going to win that argument either of us because we're probably both right. Um, I, go ahead. I just wanted to go back to uh, this type of science fiction versus um, the type of fiction that a, a core, I want to say it right. A core of four is, 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 is writing is this our techno, our, our science fiction in, in, in the United States is like, we save our very dramatic moments. We save pretty much all our story and we put it in a really small block at one instance in the story. We have the, the, the you know, the plot points and then we have like, you know, things that the, the, the climax, um, this, she takes that, that really small, uh, area, the sweet spot, but she spreads it out at, over her entire book. And, I think we can learn a lot from that type of writing where you don't have to completely, you don't have to follow the rules so much where it's all, you know, you know, build up, build up, build up, climax, uh, you know, resolution. I mean, you can, you can, you know, play with it a little bit. And I, that's what I, I think that's why I really love this book a lot. So she's, she's Nigerian American, I think, uh, Nigerian American. Um, and I think that's really something that, that I think is sort of beautiful about this is that um, is that we're starting from a different starting place than what many of us sort of are used to. And I, and this is why I am, this actually is why I'm really sort of uncomfortable, maybe not uncomfortable, but I'm, I'm skeptical about calling this mythological or, or anything like that, because I think that, I think those terms sometimes have some connotations of being flat or of being sort of a little um, hmm, old fashioned or primitive or, or this and the other. And I think it's, I think, I mean, honestly, this feels like a comic book story more than, you know, Right, like there's, I would there's argue power that that comic books are mythology. Are mythology, yeah. Um, but I, I mean, think, I mean, we could we argue have any book. Million archaeologists that come to this planet in a million years, they're going to think that we worshipped a, a mouse. <laughs> um, I'll have to wear my ears next time. Uh, <laughs> they're going to think that we we worship the Spider Man and a Batman. I mean, I think that this, these characters are fully round. I think the story has so many layers. Like if we go back to the the robot, right? Robo, Robocop, uh, Steel Brother, um, you know, they love him, but not all of them love him. Anyone who wants to live slightly outside of the narrow kind of law there very much doesn't. They they break right. She's not the first person to, to break one of those droids. Oh, they love those her droids. because of it. They invite her to parties because she can kill right. the droids. Um, and they've been throwing rocks at them in the past, right? Sure. So I think I think that I think it's just much more. I just think there's a lot of connotations that go with like terms like mythology that aren't what you mean, but they're just kind of there. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, but I think it's different connotations maybe in different places because I love reading uh, mythology and I think it's alive. It's not flat. And I think yeah. it's uh, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I've read uh, Aztec and, and um, Norse, of course. And uh, like I was, uh, we were talking about before uh, we got on the podcast, I, you know, I read the, the Toyn uh, and the, the, the Maganabi. It's all, those are Irish, uh, mythological books and i really believe completely that if you could pronounce irish names those books would be just as popular as anything else because they have a, a, a great skill of uh just completely hyperbole you know mm -hmm. everything everyone is the fastest every, every woman's a, the most beautiful woman you have ever seen every man is the fiercest man and it's the women that train the warriors and yeah. I, especially today that would be a huge thing. I mean, they did it in Brave Disney. 
Mm-hmm. Shop mm-hmm. Uh, Disney did it because you know they're getting ahead of the curve, but it was uh, it's it's great. Yeah, I totally see what you're saying. I think um, I think one of the things is it does sit somewhere in between fantasy and sci-fi, um, and I also think that you know maybe what our labels just, elements are in it. Yeah, it's it sits and a lot. There's a lot. You know, if you're not doing yeah, hard sci-fi, there's a lot of, of books out there that are living in that in-between space. But, it's but my favorite what, space. What fantasy elements are there? Well, you know, we've got the fox. Yeah. Yes. Completely right. That fox and you know, die. Everything else dies. That fox does not die. But where does the fox live? Before the meteor shower? Where she, she, He lives in the tree. That she's in when the meteor shower hits. All right. So they've got they've got maybe some of the same juju. Yeah. Hey Lee, is that a fresh uh, white cloth? It is a fresh white cloth. You heard it. You heard me cracking it. White cloth. Yeah. It's a fresh I cracked cocktail. a fresh white cloth. Yeah. I, love I promise. It. I'm I promise I'll my drink corona. something classy. Family. Next time. I promise. Dom Torelli. And I, feel like, early. I feel like this might as well be beer, so I'm still within the the realm of the name. I'll tell you what, that white yeah. claw is just as much beer as my Corona extra is. <laughs> yeah. It's a beer subset. Yeah. Oh god, and it's if terrible. That's good enough for Dominic Torelli. It's ter- the second one tastes better than the first. I'll say that much. <laughs> so, that's that's true of most things. Hey, I want I wanted to ask you, and I think this is a very you know, we, if we were to follow the whole um, rising action climax uh, resolution, uh-huh. I would say the climax in this book, and and I may be wrong because I told you she's not following the rules, would be when the leopard jumps out of the woods after uh, she's been living in the in the woods with the farmers happily, the leopard jumps out of the woods and she and she uses her powers, but can't kill it. And I wanted to know what you thought about that. Case, what do you think? Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, I mean, that was a that was a that was a uh, exciting moment for sure. I thought, like going back to what you're saying, John, that this is not typical for uh, that uh, that typical plotline that we use. I thought that the most important scene, just for me, was probably middle of the book. And, that was when the Raiders came to steal from, um, uh, steal from her friend, and she was able to hold them off um, and to somewhat control her power at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I thought that was the, a very pivotal scene. Uh, no, that was a great scene for yeah, sure. We found somebody that cared for her, gave back to her, and then she was able to, you know, um, use her power in a way. You know, I mean, she does. She uses her power in good ways throughout. She uses it to take people away from their pain. You know, I mean, she euthanizes. Well, you say that, but she actually killed that person too. Well, yeah, I mean, but a lot of families ask her to, you know, like uh, a lot of families a- ask her to come in and take um, take their loved ones who are at the last stages of life, and she does that. And um, yeah, but that that scene there where she protects the shop. Uh, was probably the most climactic moment for me, and it was not at the end of the book. You know, the end of the book felt to me like this um, really nice way to, I don't know, put put us to bed, not in a, a in a in a slow, boring way, but in a nice, comfortable way where you kind of ease ease away from ease away from um, from from the whole storyline. I thought it was great. So the leopard happens in chapter nine, right? And the name of that chapter is death. I think it's moonrise. But yeah, I don't, know. I don't know. No, it's death. Okay. Chapter nine is death, and chapter ten is New Year. Um, so if we we're going to go by the titles of the chapters, mm-hmm. I'd say that 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 you're right there. Um, for me, though, I think maybe the moment she goes back to her home. Yeah. You know, she steps into her home, and yeah, that was uh, pretty powerful. And yeah. and like no other house, every other house in that village has been uh, somebody yeah. moved into it. Yeah. No one moved into that. Nobody moved that. into it. And there's pain and then there's catharsis. Um, it's what we've been waiting for the whole time is for her to feel that, 
to feel the pain that she's been avoiding um, and then to have that catharsis. Um, so for me, I think, I think that the, the leopard scene is so pivotal. Um, but I do think that maybe, I think you're, you know, also that scene that Case is talking about where, where the, where the Raiders come and this woman she's just met who has been sort of kind and, and honest with her, honest and talk to her like a regular person. But isn't uh, she she's, using her? As yeah, but she's honest about it. Yeah. She's not, yeah, I mean. But, but my whole point with the, the, the scene that Case brought up is that uh, our protagonist kills the woman protecting no, her family. No, that happens later. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, later on. Right, she's but not in that over. scene. Right, but doesn't that negate it? I mean, does but that's what I love about this book. You think you know where it's gonna go, right? Like, okay, well, she could be, um, she could just live with this woman in her in her market, and they could be That'd happy. Be fine, yeah. And then the next scene after she kills uh, uh, one of the drones from Brother Steel, and a seven year old gets killed, and they all in the village attacks her. She can't help herself, and she lets her power out, and she kills the woman protecting her. Yeah. But I mean, that really actually seems, it's one of those, that seems pretty traditional in, in storytelling, right? The, uh, the, the moment before the big, the big, the lowest point in the character's life, right? Is, is right after a high point. You can't, you well, can't go I, all the way down. No, for me, it's a lot of good school of writing. You, you right. make all your protagonists as miserable as possible, but you you but give, you gotta give the them happiness. Something to root for. Yeah, yeah. you got to give them happiness before you can take it away, right? It felt almost normal there for a while. Yeah, and so it hurts so much more. Yeah, oh yeah, she. Felt but like then it's normal crazy. again when she's living in the woods, and then all of a sudden this leopard comes out of nowhere, and this leopard's not evil like man is yeah. evil. This leopard is just a leopard, and she turns her power on. Which happens to be right after she first gets her uh, menstruation, her period, and the leopard doesn't die. This is the. But we first. don't know. So I think there's, I think there's At some things going on here, right? So we, here's what we know: is she has been warned, sort of by the fox and by nature, that something's wrong, and she doesn't know what's coming. She doesn't know what's wrong. She kind of freaks out because everything goes quiet. And, um, and then she feels blood and she doesn't know where the blood's coming from. And then the leopard drops and she has completely forgotten she has a power and she runs terrified. And then she goes, oh, wait, I have a power. And she lets it go. And then, and I feel like, I'm sorry, everybody who hasn't read this yet. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have to, you just, you know, but and then, and then it yeah, I, I said, does work. I said flash the spoiler alerts a lot. Yeah, more. right, right. Um, so I think that, I mean, part of it is know thyself, right? Like, you know, your power is only as good as your belief in it and your knowledge of it and your control of it. Like, she reacts in fear. No, I, uh, okay. So we might uh, disagree on a lot of things, but I I totally agree with you with right know thyself. I mean, we've been right about know thyself since uh, Gilgamesh, right? Right. I mean, that's why we love Shakespeare. Fucking know thyself. Know thyself, right? Um, and 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 be freaking believe in your power, right? And you're right. It does happen when she gets her, and then we find out she gets her period. So she doesn't know that's what's going on. I mean, maybe that's some of it. Her confusion there is is strong, but you know. So you, your view is that it has something to do with that ritual of moving well, into. I was, adulthood. I was trying to say like, so she's so powerful, she's so powerful, and then she has a period and she's not as powerful anymore. And my my argument was like, I think in a, in a, as far as like this being allegorical or even mythological, is that like once. You go from childhood to adulthood. Um, you lose your power, and that might be imagine, uh, imagination or what. And, and I want to talk about, like, as far as a woman goes, and like, but she's more powerful after that. Yeah, but okay, but 
what I want to throw in this mix of us talking about this conversation is that for a woman, you have a time, a day, a, one time in your life where you're like, I'm not a child anymore, right? Uh, you know, you, you bleed and you're like, now I'm, I'm a woman. Uh, for a man, we never have that. Maybe driver's license? <laughs> I don't know, right? I, okay, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say you're wrong there. I, I, no, I, I love it. Please. It, that's not what that day is. No 13-year-old girl is like, and now I'm a grown-up woman. We're mostly like, oh, shit, this sucks. What? Forever? No. You know, <laughs> I'm still a baby. Yeah. Um, oh, I know my daughter, she's 12. She does not want this. And yeah. It's, like, so I, I don't know that it's the day that we decide we're a woman. I, I think that that's what we're told. We're told it's the day that we're a woman, but mm -hmm. I don't think it is for and us. I think that uh, Connor for uh, Akura for is, is trying to show us that. And I think that's my argument in this whole thing about the leopard not dying is like, she does become powerful afterwards, but at the time, she does not know what the fuck is going on. Yeah, I'll buy that. I'll and, buy and, that I, and, and, and I'm, I'm right there with you. I have no idea. I do really want to know, you know, because I have two daughters. I have no fucking clue. And, mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's kind of what I'm reading into it. But I, I, I do disagree in the fact that I do think that men do have that moment. Very, And it is one moment. It's that moment when after you use the restroom and you walk... <laughs> back, when he walked back in and he realized that smelled like my dad's did when I was little. Do you know that feeling? You're like, oh my gosh, I'm a man now. It's the well, truth. Well, I'm just going to leave you on that. Everybody has the memory of their dad going to the bathroom when they're little and you're like, oh my God, that's the worst thing in the entire world. That's what men smell like. Are you like. talking about shitting or pissing? Shitting. Um, you know, and you walk back, you walk out, you maybe walk back into your own bathroom. And you're like, was my dad? That makes a little bit more sense, but yeah, I don't think like, I can. I don't think I can sail on that boat. Case, his face is fantastic. It's just, I a, love it. It's just, I'm so horrified. <laughs> That's you should be. I don't know. Case decides like I'm going to go out all the way out on the end of this fucking limb, and I'm going to die on it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna loosen my tie here a little bit. I, just, I, I gotta breathe. Oh, it's still a theory. Uh, <laughs> no, that's a working theory. Let's we'll just yeah. call it a working theory. Well, so, so I'm turning you. 46 in um, two days. I'm turning 46 in two days. Happy birthday! Um, anyway. Thank you. Uh, I have one, two, I don't know. I have what, four degrees? I don't, I don't, I'm not a, I'm a, ch I don't, I, am I a woman? I don't know. Am yeah. I a grown up? I don't know. I don't have children. I think that's the day. And you have children. Well, right. I tell you, so when you go to war, because, you know, this is the one podcast I hadn't said, told everybody that I was a fucking combat veteran yet. All right. Fuck that up. But when you go to war and you come back, you're like, well, you're a man. I'm like, I don't. I don't feel any fucking different, man. You know, uh, people are shooting at me. I shut back at them and just kind of natural. I think anybody would have done that. But all <laughs> of a sudden I'm not, you know, all of a sudden like, okay, you're a man now. I just, I don't, I, I think like the more, the, the more ancient civilizations had it right where they would actually like do a, Celebration, like all right. So, and, and I know those it's celebrations. Bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah. Yeah, well, so my wife is Jewish, and my daughter is twelve, and she's thinking about doing a bar mitzvah. Although I'll have to probably be the rabbi, and, and I mean not that way, but I'll be like teach. I'd have to learn Hebrew to teach her because there's right, no rabbi in McKenzie Bridge, Oregon, in the Central Cascades, you know. And so, um, and I'm all about doing that for sure because i think it's important and, and and because we don't as a civilization as a society we don't have those moments where like okay you're not a kid anymore and I, and as much as she wants still to be a kid and i think that there's a lot of value in it being in being a kid because you know at, when we not a kid anymore we lose our imagination i really believe that i do believe there's value in saying okay here now you got a little bit more weight and you have to learn how to carry it and, I, and and we don't have that so you know 
Cubans, so my, we, we have quinceañeras, which is uh, like a sweet 15 or whatever. Um, I didn't have one. That really wasn't my bag. Uh, but I was, you know, I probably should have. Um, well, you're probably rebelling against the pageantry of it instead yeah, of yeah. the ritual of it, right? Right, right. Well, and I just, I don't know. It's a whole other story. But, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Obviously, I'm an adult. I pay bills. I own a home. You know, that's all it takes. So I don't know. I don't um, know. But I also, I'm sitting in a room. Your first, saying, electric, your first electric bill, you're like, yes! I oh, did. I don't so, know. You know. My theory is sounding most definitive right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting in a room. This is this is a house, this is an apartment, just me and my husband. I'm not going to show you the room because it's a mess, but um I have a teddy bear in my bed. I have a giant stuffed tiger on my bedside table. I have a uh, Hello Kitty stuffed Hello Kitty with wearing a Darth Vader costume on my headboard. I have um a bunch of unicorns over there and a bunch of Star Wars figurines over there. Like I'm not an adult. And, hey. and maybe if I'd had a quinceanera, I would be. Hey, Mando, does that mean that Lee's an adult? No, sorry, Mando. No. Mando <laughs> says no. Yeah, I'm not an adult. I'm not an adult. So I don't know what that day is. You know what? So, Two days from I, now, you're going to be like, I'm an adult. I'm 46. <laughs> 46. <laughs> I didn't see it coming. Uh, I told Lee, I said, you know, I said, uh, I've been thinking about it. And uh, you know Lee's husband is also named Lee. So yeah. Those of you who don't know, I'm not talking in third person. My <laughs> husband's name is Lee. You're um, earliest. I know it. Yeah. Bigfoot. Uh, <laughs> is Lee an adult? Oh, no. Oh, God. <laughs> Bigfoot's mean. Bigfoot's um, I told Lee, I said, you know, you turned 46 last year. And this year has sucked. I watched. This has been a sucky year, so I've decided I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I don't want to turn 46. Am I the well, oldest? Well, Sean, you're 42. older than me, right? I'm 48, but it's yeah, all downhill after 42 because at 42, you know the universe and life and everything. And everything, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More as the famous, you guys may not know this reference, but Brandon will, as the Oklahoma State football coach once said, when, they, when the, the media attacked his players, he said, come at me. I'm a man. I'm 40. It was really, <laughs> it's like one of the, it's, it's, I do remember that. Yeah. It was ridiculous. I'm, I'm, a man. I'm 40. I'm, man. I'm 40. Uh, so I'm so we're all, we're all, we're all men here. <laughs> we're all men here. <laughs> well, we're all men here. go home and try my theory. Uh, um, Just go. So, shit. I wish I could. That is your yeah. dad. <laughs> oh. So, so yeah, great book. <laughs> it was a great book. Um, well, I, you I, know, I was thinking we should actually tag her on this until somebody brought up their theories of age. Yeah, yeah. it was so close. <laughs> so close. Yeah, I, I have to say that. Um, so I'm teaching another one of her books next semester. Um, I'm teaching oh, Bindi. which one? Which one? Bindi. And I haven't read it yet. I'm so excited to read it. Uh, because I think I might be one of her biggest fans now. I think she's yeah. um, amazing, you know, and I had read something by her before this and I, I just realized it the other day. Uh, so um, do I well, mean, are I'm you guys comic book readers? Completely ignorant over here. I mean, the most, I think the, the blackest literature I read was Jamaica Kincaid. Oh, I, I love Jamaica Kincaid. So, well, every, uh, yeah, if you, you know, you get your mm -hmm. English degree, you have to read her, you know, uh, great and it gave me a different perspective um read some octavia butler um read frederick douglas but i mean this stuff um is so new and different and just kind of like no you don't have to do it the way that they're doing it fuck that no i'm doing it my way and i'm gonna make it amazing and, and yeah. she really did so i look forward to oh, reading yeah. do, do either of you read comic books or either all the time three of you? Yeah. huge comic she, so she wrote the shuri series Oh, okay. That's a... The Black Panthers. Yes, yeah, uh, she yeah, becomes Shuri. a Black Panther oh, next, yeah. right? Maybe. But yes, yeah, she wrote the Shuri series, which I have a bunch of. And I kind of didn't put it together. Um, so I was already a fan. 
Um, I loved this book. I absolutely yeah. loved it from, from start to finish. And even though, I mean, it was short, but it just seemed perfectly done. And like Sean was saying, it's like, well, I mean, I mean, there's a whole other discussion about the industry and about editors getting their hands on stuff and telling her to probably expand 20,000 words and, um, well, this could have been. I think it could have. I, I think they could have used the evil pharma, big pharma group, a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I would have loved to have read that. But then, I think it's going to be a series. But 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 then that would have turned into a Western action movie, <laughs> where all of a sudden, you know, she's uh, you know, sliding down the top of a you know, fifty-five story building and. And jumping and somehow, you know, jumping on a car that was flying between those buildings. I'm going back to the Fast and the Furious. So I'm just saying, like, let's just keep it pure. Keep it how yeah. it was. It's keep it pure, pure. Yeah. yeah. I loved it. I loved the book. And really? I think it also goes to show that um, we got to stop being numbers hounds. Mm-hmm. We got to stop, you know, have you reached, have you have you made 100,000 words? Have you, you know, it's not about that. It's about the story. What, what yeah, treats well, the story? I've been sharing with you guys that, you know, I, I heard that you have to hit 80,000 words to be a novel, but the, the thing that I'm working on right now went from 80,000 after I started editing to 120,000 in cases like, just do it, buddy. Just let it happen. So let that's happen. what I'm doing. Ooh. Well, that hey, was so- fast. That was a, that's 57 minutes of chatting already on this podcast. So should we wrap it or what? Is I it? think we should wrap it. Yeah, that's that's golden, golden, man. What, what are we reading next? Um, okay. so it's Iandy's book. Um, but Iandy's book. Oh, I forgot the title. Do you guys remember the title? Let me look it up. Yeah. Should we do it the first um, week again next year, next month, or should we bump it to the second weekend to get it read? I scheduled the oh, first. So, so August. We can, we'll just go back to the normal so, schedule. So, so, so August is um, we're doing the Utah Arts Festival, right? Yeah. We can talk about that. Oh yeah. Urban Beer and Books is going to be in that festival. Yeah. Can we? <laughs> we have stickers and keychains and pins. Come on now, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, be on I, stage. I know the guy who's making the schedule. Um, so well, that's that's you, buddy. I could no, it's Brandon, isn't it? Well, not for the Utah Arts Festival. No, it's, it's me. Um, and I think we have a slot open now. I think I actually plugged in literally podcast for a slot, and I actually plugged Brandon in as an MC again, but yeah, he doesn't know that yet. No, I uh, think they reached out to me and I haven't responded. So they're oh, okay. They're Respond, buddy. Like, what the hell's that guy doing? What's that guy yeah. doing? But, I got um, enough swag. We can throw it into the audience. Well, we did a literally podcast there last year, and we we we'll, we'll do it again. Uh, but this so, what's our next movie. book? Because I have the book after that. Why do I? That we can talk I'm about at the arts festival. Was it? Is was it not Iende? Who was it? I thought it was. Well, the book that I found, I wanted to do an Octavia Butler book, but I think if we're going to be on stage talking about it, I really think that we should do this book called Drunk, How We Sipped, Danced, and Stumbled Our Way into Civilization by Edward Slingengard. Slingerland. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe I was thinking of something. I don't know. I have to go back to our, our thing, our thread. We'll figure it out. And I think that'll be our first actual nonfiction book. So that'd be pretty nice. Cool. Uh, I'm for staying on schedule the first Tuesday of the month and then doing a a different book for the Utah Arts Festival, Sean. If you Yeah, so well for the Arts Festival we'll do our we usually do our halfway through the month type of thing. We'll do our halfway um, through the month type of thing at the arts festival. Right? Yeah, you think yeah, and Lee, I I mean, I'd like to pipe you in, so I'm not sure how we can do that live in front of an audience, but if you're available, I can figure that out. I have cameras. Our tech guy will figure it out. I can make myself available, probably. Brandon, you're a tech guy. Yeah, I'm the tech guy. Uh, I'll give him a call, me, and uh, we'll figure that out. Send me the dates. Okay. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, I love talking to you guys so much. I think it's the best. 
and I can get a little buzz of going on a Tuesday, and that's amazing. And so all around, what happened to Tia? She was she's like one one and done. What's the deal? No, Tia had a huge um, uh, political. She was running. She helped the new mayor of Buffalo, New York, get elected. So, and uh, she's had yeah. some other responsibilities she's had to tend to, and she's just been a little busy. I'm sure she'll be back with us be back. as soon as she can, because she's uh, such an important part of this. Yeah, I thought she'd be good with this book. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's it's, it's Alvarez, not Allende. Sorry. Um, and <laughs> I'll make it. Was... I'll make it my mission to get Tia back on drunk. How we sipped, danced, and stumbled our way to civilization. <laughs> So what's the next book for the first week in uh, August? Case. Uh, Yulia Al Al Alvarez's Afterlife. Oh, Afterlife? Well, I'm excited about that one. Yeah, I'm excited about that one, too. I, my favorite book from her was Yo. Everybody loves Garcia Girls, which I love mm -hmm. Garcia Girls. Uh, but Yo is just one of the Garcia Girls, and I think it's the most beautiful, most beautifully written. Nobody reads well, it. Well, hey, I'm not going to lie to you, Case. You burn a little bit of trust with me, this Arthur C. Clarke bullshit yeah well i don't know what i'm getting into this time <laughs> i think it's gonna be awesome i'm yeah. really excited so all right yeah. uh thank you everyone for listening that's yeah. a wrap that's a wrap Audio. That's a wrap. all right all right you guys are the best <laughs> good job guys